communications to move people and things and orders and ideas. Communications to keep the peace, to nourish the healthy, to sustain the sick, to keep the place going. Give me the fire service straight away. Three injured, 75 North Road. Right, be there right away. You can liken it to an immense and busy brain. Always at work, never at peace. But you cannot really do that. For compared with the simplest human brain, London is small and clumsy. London may have 8 million people, but your brain has 15,000 million cells, six times more than all the people in the world. Now, suppose, for example, that London's central telephone exchanges were bombed. Your body, too, depends completely on such efficient communications. On the signals from your arms and legs, your ears and eyes. They are sorted out in your brain, passed back for the necessary action. But suppose your central exchange was damaged before your birth. Your limbs are without guidance, unable to do what you tell them. If your brain were damaged here, you would be a true spastic with slow, stiff movements. If it were damaged here, you'd be an athetoid, with your movements sudden and meaningless. If it were damaged here, you'd be an ataxic, moving involuntarily all the time. Every eight hours, another spastic child is born in Britain. Every eight hours, of every day, of every week, of every year. Every eight hours. There are more than 40,000 spastics living in Britain today. More than 40,000. And those are the ones that we know about. How many are there that we don't know about? Hidden away, perhaps, for years by their families. Fearful of the neighbours saying, they've got a child who's a bit funny. 40,000 spastics. What's being done to help them? Let's trace the history. 1943. The first spastic centre we had ever known was started in Carshalton by a physiotherapist, Mrs. Collis, who'd worked with spastics in America. 1946. Henry Weston started the first society, the British Council for the Welfare of Spastics. He attracted the interest of Mr. Bosworth Smith of the Ministry of Education. Together, they encouraged parents to form their own groups. That year, the Scottish Council for the Care of Spastics was born. Mr. J. Leslie Williams opened the first residential school for spastics at Croydon. 1948. In Devon, they started the first Dame Hannah Rogers School. And Miss McIndoe, a spastic herself, opened the Puckle Hill School for adolescents at Gravesend. Everything now seemed set fair. And then, for three long years, little happened. The National Health Service, so newly formed, had its hands full with other problems. The first spastic society was in no position to launch a frontal attack. Now, the longer you delay treatment of a growing spastic, the less the child will improve. Parents knew this and were desperate. And now enter four completely new people, each of them determined to do something more about this awful problem. Ian Dawson Shepherd, Alex Moira, 
Eric Hodgson, and Jean Garwood. It is 1951, and with a capital of five pounds, they start the National Spastic Society. They draw up a five-year plan to raise a million pounds, to establish parents' groups in every big town, to open local and national pilot centres for spastics, to persuade the powers that be, local authorities or Westminster, to set up more and more centres, and to tell the British public what it's all about, to tell it loud and clear to the lucky ones, the ones like us. Perhaps one person in a thousand had heard the word spastic, and fewer still knew what it meant. Every means was used to reach the people. The Daily Mirror featured spastics in its Ruggles cartoon. Money's the thing, you know. Money can buy a lot more than you imagine. Parents' groups started collection drives, because sometimes the only way to get money is to go out and ask for it. A good cause? No. A proper cause. A righteous cause. A decent justification for a fit man's right to be strong and straight and in command of his body. There were hundreds of thousands of leaflets. The press, the television, the newsreels and the radio paid attention. New parents groups were started in England and Wales. There even arrived a special spastics newspaper to keep everyone in touch, in communication. Target, one million pounds. It didn't come in all that easily to begin with. Does money ever come in easily? But there were many devices. In 1953, there came the Christmas seals. First, two million of them. Now, 160 million. Pubs turned themselves into a network of collecting centers. There were new ideas in shops. And then in came show business. The entertainers started their own efforts with Wilfred Pickles, the star's organization for spastics. Million pounds for spastic. And in 1957, target achieved. <laughs> and then crisis. Growth had been so rapid that within a few months, one million wasn't enough. Plans for expansion couldn't get underway. But a bold announcement was made. The target for the next three years was two million pounds, every penny of which would be needed for the job that had to be done. And in 1959, target achieved again. Three million pounds in all. Money out of the public's pocket, your pocket. Now, what has the National Spastic Society done with this money? How's it being spent? Well, here's Hawksworth Hall, a long-term assessment center for spastics the first of its kind in the world. After a spell here, the children who'd previously been thought impossible to educate at all can be sent on to one of the society's schools. At regular intervals, a board meets at Hawksworth Hall to assess each child's capabilities. They're examined medically. And by a psychologist in the most complete and thorough way that's possible in Britain. The experts determine their chances. How much can be hoped for from each individual? What treatment 
what establishment will be the most suitable and valuable for the child. The decision is reviewed after a few months. Near Tixover is the Wilfred Pickles Residential School. It looks after children between five and 16. This nine years old boy is an athertoid. He cannot sit up for any length of time. He cannot write, but he can work a typewriter. And the result of this difficult and awkward struggle is good work by any standards. Sums are written in his exercise book and he hammers out the answers on the machine. His essays would do credit to any boy. All this would have been barred to him before. This young fellow had not been to school at all until he was nearly 12. He cannot use his hands enough even to work a typewriter, let alone to grasp a pencil. A little ingenuity comes to the rescue. And with this tool and a special keyboard, he can now express on paper the perfectly normal thoughts of his mind. Here he is writing his first letter home. This isn't funny or sad or even pathetic. This is healthy adaptability. If you like cricket, okay, you play cricket. And if you have to bat from a wheelchair, or if you can't run about when you field, well, that's a game too, isn't it? And if you're a girl, netball can be played one-handed, can't it? It may not be roading standard, but who cares? The Thomas de la Rue Grammar School for Spastics is the first of its kind in the world. Pupils here sit GCE on a level with any other pupil in Britain. In 1957, the Ministry of Education's official report said, the National Spastic Society are to be congratulated on the way they have accommodated, equipped and staffed the school. This school includes a business course too, where the older pupils learn typing and secretarial work, ready to earn a living alongside anyone else. The boys learn to use tools, sometimes adapted, so that they can produce work of a genuinely high standard. You can still find extraordinary resources of skill in a troubled body. This girl, with just two fingers and her teeth, makes a fine job of sewing these sails, for example. Girls grow up. One day they may have a home to run, and so they learn cookery and domestic science. You may be handicapped, but you can still be a housewife. These children look sound and eager enough for education, but education is seldom easy for them. Dr. Wall, director of the National Foundation for Educational Research, has this to say about the problem. Of course, ordinary children present a large number of problems on which we ought to do research. But the cerebrally palsied child presents problems of an educational kind which are much more tricky and much more difficult than those even of the ordinary uh, physically or mentally or sensorially handicapped children. For example, the child who has brain damage is liable to have difficulties in all the special senses, or in one or other of them, of two kinds. He may have difficulty simply in seeing, like the blind child. But he may also have a difficulty in that he can see, but he can't really organize centrally uh, what he sees. Similarly, you can get a child who has deafness of the ordinary kind, or you may have a child who can hear perfectly well, but has great difficulty in understanding what he hears. Or again, you may have a child who has a selective form of deafness. For example, he can't perhaps hear 
the high notes in speech. And the sort of thing that I'm saying to you now will sound him rather like this. <laughs> Now, this kind of problem occurs not merely with hearing, but with vision, and to some extent it occurs also in the whole organization of the space in which he lives, which is so important to the actual construction of intelligence. But learning isn't only an intellectual business, and indeed for handicapped children, the emotional factors in learning are perhaps even more important than the intellectual ones. And it's about these, too, that we know so little. Now, the kind of program which obviously is necessary is going to be fairly expensive. In my view, it'll probably cost about £50,000 a year because you've got to get some of the best brains we can find in the field of psychology and education to work on us. And this means, really, that we may have to fund as much as a million pounds to finance it over the next 10 or 15 years. But let me emphasize one thing finally. This sounds a lot of money, but in proportion to the amount of money which is spent on educating these and other children, and in proportion to the kind of return which this means in human happiness, it's really very little. Near Wellin is Sherrard's, the first training center for spastics. To get to Sherrard's, spastics must first of all be on the Ministry of Labour's list of unemployables. The centre will eventually be able to take 60 trainees. But at the moment, there's a long waiting list. It isn't meaningless institutional work either. The trainees here make things. They actually fulfil contracts for industry. And the woodworking department, very appropriately, makes the society's collecting boxes. Yes, there have been many successes. But there have also been cases with no improvement. Cases where the early damage to the central nervous system has been too great, or where treatment began too late to do much good. It is for just these people that Darsbury Hall exists. For them, this is the end of the road. They are cruelly and irremediably handicapped. Yet they too can do something useful, contribute something, however slowly, to the world in which they live. It would be foolish to say that this can ever be much, but it is the one thing between them and despair. Here are four of them, each handicapped in a different way, cooperating in working a carpet loom. There are other residential schools and centres at Coombe Farm, Craigie Park, Burton Hall, Prested Hall and Colwall Court. And of course local centres, more than 50 of them. Stockport now is a typical example of a local centre that provides education, therapy and occupational training for older children. The children in this advanced class may well go on to other schools. Others may have to wait a long time for that chance. On some, fate has played a really cruel and tragic trick. This little boy is six. He's not only a spastic, he's also blind. Here in this physiotherapy nursery, a curious lesson is being learned. A baby is being taught how to be a baby. The thing is, she doesn't know. Everything that comes naturally to any normal child even such things as finding her face or rubbing her eyes. She has got to learn. She must be shown her own identity. She must even establish where her arms and her legs are and how to move them and flex them and finally use them. In fact, here begins the lesson of how one day to be a person. Yes, the picture's changed all right. There's a lot of light where there used to be darkness. Not yet enough, but more each year. 
1957, the Duke of Edinburgh agreed to become president of the society. The director is Dr. Stevens. The staff has grown from one overworked secretary to a total of 550, of whom more than 300 are doctors, therapists, teachers, and house parents. But treatment and schooling and training are not the only concern of the society. Fundamental medical research is needed. So, in 1954, the society appointed a research physician at Guy's Hospital. He works here in Keats House, under the direction of a medical advisory committee. Soon afterwards, at the committee's request, a consultative research committee was formed from a group of leading specialists in related branches of medicine. All this money, all these schools, all this training, all this research, does it help the spastic to achieve a real improvement in his condition? Does it bring him any nearer a normal life? Well, there's a simple answer. It gives him the only chance he'll ever get of leading a more normal life, the only chance of getting an education, the only chance of getting a job. This schoolboy has passed his GCE, and brilliantly. Not so long ago, he wouldn't even have been able to try. Now he has much more than an active present. He has a future. For this girl, there's a long, hard road ahead. It won't be easy, but at the end of it, there is freedom. She may manage to go all the way. She may stop short on the road. So much depends on her, and so much depends on the National Spastic Society. They once put this young man in an unemployable class, and they were dead wrong, because already he's opened the door to freedom. He's working in a factory doing a job for the community and for himself. Already, 200 spastics have moved into jobs in open industry, in the open world. So what of the future? Well, the National Spastic Society has, in its own words, barely scratched the surface of the problem. Three things are needed. First, more treatment. There is a chronic shortage of physiotherapists. To improve this situation, the Society has instituted scholarships for student physiotherapists who hope to work in the field of cerebral palsy. The second thing is more schools and centres. Within the next three years, more than a million pounds will be spent on new national schools and residential centres, including a centre for so-called ineducable spastics, those who cannot make use of ordinary education. And third, more research. Here is what the Society's Medical Advisory Committee chairman has to say in a discussion with Dr. Stevens. It used to be said that one of the causes of cerebral palsy was prematurity. What part do you think that prematurity plays? Well, th th there is no doubt that a certain proportion of prematurely born babies are spastic. And uh, therefore, anything which would reduce the number of premature babies would indirectly cut down the number of spastic babies. Then there's been some very interesting work that the director of the research unit has done on chromosome studies. Is this going to be important? Well, yes. You see, this takes the matter right further back. Uh, it might be argued that the premature baby who was paralyzed, who was spastic, that the two had the same cause. And that would, you'd have to go right back then to the beginning of things, to the germ cell, and this is where the chromosome story comes in. Because by a detailed study of the germ cell and by counting and marking out these fascinating little things called genes and the chromosomes on the genes, you may be able to pinpoint uh, an abnormal germ cell which leads on to cerebral palsy or mental defect or something of that sort. This means, of course, that you've got to examine and consider the general health of mothers throughout their pregnancy. Oh, yes, because, it, you see, you've got two factors. You may have an abnormal germ cell, but if the mother's health in pregnancy and in nutrition and everything else is kept up to a high standard, then you may minimize the bad effects of what you might call the, the hereditary or genetic aspect of it. And this has nothing to do with the rhesus factor? No, that's a specific example of, of a, 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 um, an unfortunate ill health situation between mother and baby, where the, the baby's blood cells and the mother's blood cells don't match properly and they get this jaundice at birth and uh, because of the jaundice certain parts of the brain get damaged and they can get cerebral palsy and become spastic. 
Now this is perhaps one of the most hopeful lines of prevention in the sense that experts now claim that with proper supervision during pregnancy and with a team available to deal with the baby as soon as it arrives, uh, possibly as little as four or five percent of rhesus factor babies uh, ought to be damaged at all. In other words, 95 percent or more could be saved from trouble. We are in fact supporting some research in Bristol which is going to go even further. Now the Bristol, the Bristol work is fascinating. The idea there is to instead of leaving in the severe cases the baby to be born and then try and deal with the jaundice situation, there we're trying to give the baby the proper sort of red cells while he's still in his mother's womb. There must be some way to go on that yet, but we've come quite a way in five years, haven't we? How much further do you think we shall have to go? Huh. Well, in one way, the sky's the limit, Dr. Stevens. Um, you see, I think that all research, all investigation into a wide variety of children's diseases and problems will throw some light on the problems of the spastic child. Equally, research on the problems of the spastic child will throw light upon other uh, disorders in childhood. I, I think already we're learning that the spastic child isn't just paralyzed in muscles. It, it, it's, uh, it can't really appreciate um, its own movements. It doesn't know where its hands are. It doesn't know where its feet are. This, what we call the sensory side of the business, is fascinating, and I'm sure it's got uh, lessons for educationalists and others. Well, now, if you take that wide view, where is the limit? You can go on forever, and you've got to find a lot of money. So that it's right that we should be setting up a child health research unit? Oh, oh. yes, I'm sure. You, you can't separate it out. The child as a whole is your problem, if you're going to get the answers. You can't say we will only study the cerebral palsy spastic child. I've done some preliminary thought on this. And it looks to me as if to set up the kind of research unit that we want over the next few years, we're going to need somewhere between two and two and a half million pounds. We can start off with, say, a quarter of a million pounds now, and we'll find the rest because we must. But is that going to be enough? It'll be a good start anyway, won't it? I mean, you don't know where you're going to get to. You see, I think always in research, you've got to have in reserve uh, some facilities and money for chasing the interesting hair. Something blows up in the course of a general programme, which is fearfully important. Fleming's dust coming in at St Mary's Hospital, and there was penicillin. There wasn't at the time any pursuit of that, was there? It lay dormant for some years. But, you see, you may blow up something in the course of general research, and you've got to have the reserves and the money to go after it. There's no other child health research unit in this country. No, not so, specifically, uh, I suppose all children's departments and, and, and children's hospitals do what they can, but there isn't a specially set up unit with full facilities for laboratory research in that sense. We think, of course, that we're leading the world in studies of cerebral palsy. Shall we be leading the world in this field too? Well, well you soon will if you set up the right sort of department and you can feed it in with enough money and men. Dr. Paul Polani is the Society's Director of Research. Your task as head of the research unit is to coordinate and perhaps to inspire the work of the different sections. How big a unit do you expect it's going to be? Well, this is sort of a very provisional thing, but uh, we would have, of course, our epidemiology section, our clinical section or group. Then we would have our chromosome study group. Um, you would have a biochemical group or a group of people interested in the biochemistry side and um, well, some experimental work as well going on. The ugly word which is used for this sort of approach is multidisciplinary, isn't it? Which, is, which means really a lot of people putting together their heads and working on a common problem from different angles. This is really what we are aiming to do. Uh, cerebral palsy is not a disease, it's a disorder for one thing, and it's not an entity, but it's many entities, and we do not know in fact how many, so that we have to bring on this problem, uh, we have to bring the energies to bear of many people, of course. Spastics improve slowly, very slowly, painfully slowly. Many have to face the world still severely handicapped. How does the world face them. 
Hello. I'm Bill Hargreaves. As you can see by the way I walk, I am a spastic. I was only two and a half pounds when I was born, and I was eight years old before I could take my first faltering steps. But I don't want your pity. I'm all right now. I have a most charming wife and two bonny children. But it wasn't always like that. Look at these hands. They seem pretty normal now, don't they? But at one time, they were so clumsy that I couldn't write or pick up a cup of tea without spilling it all over the place. They're all right now and can do a good job of work. And I do know that most spastics, if given the right chance, can do a job of work. The sad thing about some spastics is that they cannot control their facial muscles properly. They appear to be, well, idiotic. But this is just not so. In most cases, it is a question of an intelligent mind locked in an unintelligent body. Just look at this boy for a minute. He's only walking. It may not look much, but it is so much more than he could do a year or two ago. This girl couldn't walk at all. It has been such a struggle, so much effort, but there you are. This man's right hand was quite useless to him, and he couldn't get a job. So what did he do? He had it amputated. Now, with a hook, he can do a job. I am the industrial liaison officer to the National Spastic Society, and my job is to find jobs for spastics. And the point I want to make quite clear is this. We spastics do not want sympathy. What we need is understanding to enable us to stand on our own feet on our merits alone. After all, we spastics are ordinary people who are handicapped. You have seen how spastics have been medically treated, educated and employed. And you've seen how well the society cares for those who do not improve. I've told you about the vast medical and educational research plan. I need only repeat that every eight hours, every day, every week, every month, every year, another spastic is born in Britain. Thank you.